although she shed no blood except what flowed from her eyes with her tears nor was lacerated in her, in her flesh yet the bodily pains so changed and disfigured her that st john and the holy women failed to find in her any resemblance of herself besides the tortures of the body she suffered ineffable sorrows of the soul there sorrow was augmented in proportion to the immensity of her insight ecclesiastes one eighteen for her sorrows flowed not only from the natural love of a mother and a supreme love of christ as her god but it was proportioned to her power of judging more accurately than all creatures of the innocence of christ the dignity of his divine person the atrocity of the insults coming from the perfidious jews and the children of adam whom he was freeing from eternal death having at length executed the sentence of scourging the executioners unbound the lord from the column and with imperious and blasphemous presumption commanded him immediately to put on his garment but while they had scourged the most meek master one of his tormentors instigated by the devil had hidden his clothes out of sight in order to prolong the nakedness and exposure of his divine person for their derision and sport this evil purpose suggested by the devil was well known to the mother of the lord she therefore making use of her power as queen commanded lucifer and all his demons to leave the neighborhood and immediately compelled by her sovereign power and virtue they fled she gave orders that the tunic be brought by the holy angels within reach of her most holy son so that he could again cover his sacred and lacerated body all this was immediately attended to although the sacrilegious ex executioners understood not the miracle nor how it had been wrought they attributed attributed it all to the sorcery and magic of the demon during this protracted nakedness our savior had in addition to his wounds suffered greatly from the cold of that morning as mentioned by the evangelist mark fourteen fifty five luke twenty two thirty five john eighteen eighteen his sacred blood had frozen and compressed the wounds which had become inflamed and extremely painful the cold had diminished his powers of resistance although the fire of his infinite charity strained them to the utmost in order to suffer more and more. Though compassion is so natural in rational creatures, there was none for him in his affliction and necessity except that of his sorrowful mother who tearfully bewailed and pitied him in the name of the whole human race. Among other divine mysteries hidden to the wise of this world, this also causes great astonishment that the wrath of the Jews, who were men of flesh and blood like ourselves, should not have been appeased at their seeing Christ torn and wounded by five thousand one hundred and fifteen lashes. But the sight of a person so lacerated should not have moved their natural compassion, but should arouse their envy to inflict new and unheard of tortures upon the victim. Their implacable fury at once planned another outrageous cruelty. They went to Pilate, and in the presence of his counselors said, quote, This seducer and deceiver of the people, Jesus of Nazareth, in his boasting and vanity has sought to be recognized by all as the king of the jews in order that his pride may be humbled and his presumption be compounded we desire your permission to place upon him the royal insignia merited by his fantastic pretensions unquote. pilate yielded to the unjust demand of the jews permitting them to proceed according to their intentions thereupon they took jesus to the praetorium where with the same cruelty and contempt they again despoiled him of his garments and in order to deride him before all the people as a counterfeit king clothed him in a much torn and soiled mantle of purple color they placed also upon his sacred head a cap made of woven thorns to serve him as a crown john nineteen two this cap was woven of thorn branches and in such a manner that many of the hard and sharp thorns would penetrate into the skull some of them to the ears and others to the eyes. Hence, one of the greatest tortures suffered by the Lord was that of the crown of thorns. Instead of a scepter, they placed into his hands a contemptible reed. They also threw over his shoulders a violet-colored mantle, something of the style of capes worn in churches. For such a garment belonged to the vesture of a king. In this array of a mocking, of a mock king, the perfidious Jews decked him out, who by his nature and by every right was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Apocalypse 19.16 Then all the soldiers in 
presence of the priests and Pharisees gathered around him and heaped upon him with their blasphemous mockery and derision. Some of them bent their knees and mockingly said to him, God save thee, king of the Jews. Others buffeted him. Others snatched the cane from his hands and struck him on his crowned head. Others ejected their disgusting spittle upon him. All of them, instigated by furious demons, insulted and affronted him in different manners. O charity, incomprehensible and exceeding all measure, O patience never seen or imagined among mortals, who, O my Lord and God, since thou art the true and mighty God, both in essence and in thy works, who could oblige thee to suffer the humiliation of such unheard-of torments, insults, and blasphemies? On the contrary, O my God, who among men has not done many things which offend thee, who among men has not done many things which offend thee, and which should have caused thee to refuse suffering and to deny them thy favor? Who could ever believe all this if we knew not of thy infinite goodness? But now, since we see it, and in firm faith look upon such admirable blessings and miracles of love, where is our judgment? What effect upon us has the light of truth? What enchantment is this that we suffer, since at the very sight of thy sorrows, scourges, thorns, insults, and affronts, we seek for ourselves, without the least shame or fear, the delights, the riches, the ease, the preferments and vanities of this world. Truly great is the number of fools, Ecclesiastes 1.15, since the greatest foolishness and dishonesty is to recognize a debt and be unwilling to pay it, to receive blessings and never give thanks for them, to have before one's eyes the greater good and despise it, to claim it for ourselves and make no use of it, to turn away and fly from life and seek eternal death. The most innocent Jesus opened not his mouth in those great and many injuries, nor was the furious wrath of the Jews appeased, either by the mockery and derision of the divine master, or by the torments added to the contempt of his most exalted person. It seemed to Pilate that the spectacle of a man so ill-treated as Jesus of Nazareth would move and fill with shame the hearts of the, that ungrateful people. He therefore commanded Jesus to be brought from the praetorium to an open window where all could see him crowned with thorns disfigured by the scourging and the ignominious vesture of a mock king pilate himself spoke to the people calling out to them esse homo behold what a man john nineteen five see this man whom you hold as your enemy what more can i do with him than to have him to have punished him in this severe manner you certainly have nothing more to fear from him. I do not find any cause of death in him. What this judge said was certainly the full truth, but in his own words he con con condemned his outrageous injustice, since knowing and confessing that this man was just and not guilty of death, he had nevertheless ordered him to be tormented and punished in such a way that according to the natural course he should have been killed many times over. O oh, blindness of self-love! O oh, hellish malice of esteeming only the influence of those who can, can confer or take away mere earthly dignities. How deeply do such motives obscure the reason? How much do they twist the course of justice? How completely do they pervert the greatest truths in judging the just by the standards of the unjust? Tremble, ye judges of the earth. Psalms 2.10 Look to it that the sentences you render are not full of deceit. For you yourselves shall be judged and condemned by your unjust judgments. As the priests and Pharisees, in their eager and insatiable hostility, were irre irrevocably bent upon taking away the life of Christ our Savior, nothing but his death would content or satisfy them. Therefore they answered Pilate, quote, Crucify him! Crucify him! John 19.6 When the blessed... Among women, Most Holy Mary saw her divine son as Pilate showed him to the people and heard him say, Esse homo. She fell upon her knees and openly adored him as the true God-man. The same was also done by St. John and the holy women, together with all the holy angels of the Queen and Lady, for they saw that not only Mary, as the mother of the Savior, 
but that God himself desired them to thus act, desired them thus to act. The most prudent lady spoke to the Eternal Father, to the angels, and especially to her most beloved son, precious words of sorrow, compassion, and profound reverence, possible to be conceived only in her chaste and love-inflamed bosom. In her exalted wisdom, she pondered also the ways and means by which the evidences of his innocence could be made most opportunely manifest at a time when he was so insulted, mocked, and despised by the Jews. With this most proper intention, she renewed the petitions above mentioned, namely that Pilate, in his quali quality of judge, continue to maintain the innocence of Jesus, our Redeemer, and that all the world should understand that Jesus was not guilty of death, nor of any of the crimes imputed to him by the Jews. On account of these prayers of the Most Blessed Mother, Pilate was made to feel great compassion at, this, at seeing Jesus so horribly scourged and ill-treated, and regret at having punished him so severely. Although he was passionate, Although he was naturally disposed to such emotions by his soft and compassionate disposition, yet they were principally caused by the light he received through the intercession of the Queen and Mother of Grace. This same light moved the unjust judge, after the crowning of thorns, to prolong his parley with the Jews for the release of Christ, as it is recorded in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. When they again asked him to crucify the Lord, he asked, quote, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find any cause for doing it. They replied, quote, According to our law, he is guilty of death, for he claims to be the Son of God. This reply threw Pilate into greater consternation, for he conceived it might be true that Jesus was the Son of God, according to his heathen notions of the divinity. Therefore he withdrew with Jesus into the praetorium, where, speaking with him alone, he asked whence he was. The Lord did not answer this question, for Pilate was not in a state of mind either to understand or to merit a reply. Nevertheless, he insisted and said to the king of heaven, quote, Dost thou then not speak to me? Dost thou not know that I have the power to crucify thee and power to dismiss thee? Pilate sought to move him to defend himself and tell what he wanted to know. It seemed to Pilate that a man so wretched and tormented would gladly accept any offer of favor from a judge. But the master of truth answered Pilate without defending himself, but with unexpected dignity, for he said, quote, Thou shouldest not have any power against me unless it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin, unquote. This answer by itself made the condemnation of Christ inexcusable in Pilate, since he could have understood their form therefrom that neither he nor Caesar had any power of jurisdiction over this man, Jesus, that by a much higher decree he had been so unreasonably and unjustly delivered over to his judgment, that therefore Judas and the priests had committed a greater sin than he in not releasing him, and that nevertheless he too was guilty of the same crime, though not in such a high degree. Pilate failed to arrive at these mysterious truths, but he was struck with still greater consternation at the words of Christ our Lord, and therefore made still more strenuous efforts to liberate him. The priests, who were now abundantly aware of his intentions, threatened him with the displeasure of the emperor, which he would incur if he permitted this one who had aspired to be king to escape death. They said, quote, If thou freest this man, thou art no friend of Caesar since he who makes a king of himself rises up against his orders and commands. Unquote. They urged this because the Roman emperors never permitted anyone in the whole empire to assume the title or insignia of a king without their consent and order. If therefore Pilate should permit it, he would contravene the decrees of Caesar. He was much disturbed at this malicious and threatening intimation of the Jews, and seating himself in his tribunal at the sixth hour, in order to pass sentence upon the Lord, he once more turned to, to plead with the Jews, saying, See, they are your king. And all of them answered, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! 
he replied, Shall I crucify your king? Whereupon they shouted unanimously, We have no king than Caesar. Pilate permitted himself to be overcome by the obstinacy and malice of the Jews. On the day of Paris, Parisev, then, seated in his tribunal, I'm not sure if I pronounce that word right, P-A-R-A-S-C-E-V-E, -E. seated in his tribunal, which the Greek, which in Greek was called Lithostratos, and in Hebrew, Gabatha, he Gabatha, Gabatha, he pronounced the sentence of death against the author of life, as I shall relate in the following chapter. The Jews departed from the hall in great exultation and joy, proclaiming the sentence of the most innocent lamb. That they did not realize whom they thus sought to annihilate was the occasion of our redemption. All this was well known to the sorrowful mother, who, though outside the hall of judgment, saw all the proceedings by exalted vision. When the priests and Pharisees rushed forth, exulting in the condemnation of Christ to the death, of the cross the pure heart of this most blessed mother was filled with new sorrow and was pierced and transfixed with the sword of unalleviated bitterness since the sorrow of most holy mary on this occasion surpassed all that can enter the thoughts of man it is useless to speak more of it and it must be referred to the pious meditation of christians just as impossible is it to enumerate her interior acts of adoration worship reverence love compassion sorrow and resignation instruction which the great queen and lady of heaven gave me my daughter thou reflect reflectest with wonder upon the hardness and malice of the jews the weakness of pilate who knew their evil dispositions and permitted himself to be overcome though fully convinced of the innocence of my son and lord i wish to relieve thee of this astonishment by furnishing thee with instructions and warnings suitable for making thee careful on the path of eternal life know then that the ancient prophecies concerning the mysteries of the redemption and all the holy scriptures were to be infallibly fulfilled for sooner shall heaven and earth fall to pieces than that their words fail of their effect as determined in the divine mind Matthew twenty four thirty five, Acts three eighteen, in order that the most ignominious death foretold by my Lord should be brought about. Jeremiah eleven nineteen, and there's one other S A P, I'm not sure which book that stands for. Two twenty. It was necessary that he should be persecuted by men, but that these men should happen to be the Jews, the priests, and the unjust Pilate was their own misfortune, not the choice of the Almighty, who wishes to save all. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Their own wickedness and malice brought them to their ruin, for they resisted the great grace of having in their midst their Redeemer and Master, of knowing him, of conversing with him, of hearing his doctrine and preaching, of witnessing his miracles and they had received such great favors as none of the ancient patriarchs had attained by all their longings. Matthew 13, 7 Hence, the cause of the Savior was justified. He manifestly had cultivated his vineyard by his own hands and showed his favors upon it. Matthew 21, 33 But it brought him only thorns and briars, and its keepers took away his life, refusing to recognize him. He was their opportunity and their duty as was their opportunity and their duty before all other men. This same which happened in the head, Christ the Lord and, and Son of God, this same which happened in the head, Christ the Lord and Son of God, must happen to all the members of his mystical body, that is, to the just and predestined to the end of the world. For it would be monstrous to see the members incongruous with the head. The children show no relation with the Father, or the disciples unlike their master. All those sinners must always exist, Matthew eighteen seven. since in this world the just shall always be mingled with the unjust, the predestined with the reprobate, the persecutors with the persecuted, the murderers with the murdered, 
the afflicting with the afflicted. Yet these lots are decided by the malice and goodness and the goodness of men. Unhappy shall be he through whom scandal comes into the world, and who thus makes himself an instrument of the demon. This kind of activity was begun in the new church by the priests and Pharisees, and by Pilate, who was persecuted, who all and by Pilate, who all persecuted the head of this mystic body, and in the further course of the world, by all those who persecute its members, the saints and the predestined, imitating and following the Jews and the devil in their evil work. Think well, then, my dearest, which of these lots thou wishest to choose in the sight of my son and me, if thou seest thy Redeemer, thy spouse, and thy chief, tormented, afflicted, crowned with thorns, and saturated with reproaches, and at the same time desirous to have a part in him, and be a member of his mystical body, it is not becoming or even possible that thou live steeped in the pleasures of the flesh. Thou must be the persecuted and not the persecutor, the oppressed and not the oppressor, the one that bears the cross, that encounters the scandal, and not that gives it, the one that suffers, and at the same time makes none of the neighbor suffer. On the contrary, thou must exert thyself for their conversion and salvation in as far as is compatible with the perfection of thy state and vocation. This is the portion of the friends of God and the inheritance of his children in mortal life. In this consists the participation in grace and glory, which by his torments and reproaches and by his death of the cross my Son and Lord has purchased for them. I too have cooperated in this work, and have paid the sorrows and afflictions which thou hast understood, and which I wish thou shalt never allow to be blotted out from my, from thy, from my inmost memory. The Almighty would indeed have been powerful enough to exalt his predestined in this world, to give them riches and favors beyond those of others, to make them strong as lions for reducing the rest of mankind to their invincible power, but it was inopportune to exalt them in this manner. In order that men might not be led into the error of thinking that greatness consists in what is visible, and happiness in earthly goods, lest being induced to forsake virtues and obscure the glory of the Lord, they, they fail to experience the efficacy of divine grace and cease to aspire toward spiritual and eternal things. This is the science which I wish thee to study continually, and in which thou must advance day by day, putting into practice all that thou learnest to understand and know. All praise, glory, honor, love be to our wonderful Savior, Jesus, who suffered so much for us. May God bless and keep you.